If y'all would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. I'd just like to say a couple of things by introduction, if that's all right, before we get started. And the first thing is uh, to express my gratitude for y'all letting me be a part of your work this weekend. Um, I think this will be a, a fun time together to be able to encourage each other and talk about the things we're going to spend our time on. Um, as, uh, as people who are loyal to the king. Um, I, I don't really know what your norm is in this church in general, or whenever y'all do these things, I'm just going to tell y'all if it's okay, I'd, I'd like us to be able to conduct these in sort of a, a interactive discussion format. I may kind of run for a couple minutes talking about some things, but, uh, but I'll try to ask some questions that hopefully are straightforward enough to where they're actually useful for some conversation, and uh, hopefully that'll help guide us through some thoughts. So if you would, just be ready to kind of shout on out um, your thoughts about things as we go. Uh, we are going to talk about what it means to be disciples. Um, and in just a second, I'd actually like us to try to kind of work together on how we think about that, how we should define that concept of being a disciple. But this comes, this is a, a featured term in the Gospel of Matthew. As a matter of fact, I find it interesting that in the very last um, scene of the Gospel of Matthew, when the apostles are the apostles, they're the special crew that Jesus had picked out, how does Matthew still define he and his um, comrades, he doesn't call them the exalted term apostles. He still refers to himself and their selves as disciples. And so it's important for us to learn to think of ourselves as disciples and exactly what that means for us as we're trying to live in the way that the Lord would have us. Um, so let, let's do actually just work on this a little bit before we get into uh, what we're actually going to talk about for the next few minutes. When you hear the word disciple, and I'm not talking about a Webster's Dictionary, although if you want to cheat and look that up, that's fine, but that's not what I'm looking for, but a, a real life, a practical explanation sort of definition. What is a disciple? Somebody shows up, maybe here. Maybe somebody showed up here. Maybe you got invited by a friend. You don't even do this church stuff or Bible stuff. I'm glad you're here. Uh, imagine we just went on talking about disciples all night, and you got back in the car, and your friend said, hey, what was that? What is a disciple? How would you describe that concept? How would you describe that term? What's a disciple? And you don't have to be religious, by the way. We can broaden this out because it's not necessarily a religious word. Stand at the feet of somebody trying to learn from them. Okay. Sit at the, why did you say the sit at the feet part? Trying to learn from somebody, but what do you mean by the sit at the feet part? It's more of the kind of nature, you know, something mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think that posture indicates? If you sit at someone's feet to learn from them, uh, what does that indicate about your posture toward them or your attitude toward them? There's some respect there, right? I mean, I'm sure, actually, we know this. There were times whenever the disciples were sitting around a table or walking along. They weren't actually sitting down all the time, but that is the, the phrase that Paul uses in other, in, or used other, in other places. Uh, and so there's this deep respect for the one from whom you're learning. All right, good. Keep going. Uh, other thoughts and def ways to define and expand on this notion of what it means to be a disciple. I think when you do this long term, like we do with food, for instance, every day the next day, the next day, like that person is discipling me. I think that the fact that I call them um, committed to another person's values, beliefs, That's a good word, to be tutored by somebody. And I like what you said, there's a, there's a, a level of commitment. And actually, I think you're right. We, we do hear this word used. I mean, you guys probably hear it not very often, but we'll hear it in other contexts besides religious context or besides uh, context of speaking about our Lord. Uh, because there are times where we see people who are disciples of some entrepreneur or disciples of some uh, thought leader or disciples, whatever the case may be. I, I'm committed to this person, and I'm being educated by them. I'm being tutored by them. I'm being guided by them. Keep going. Thoughts about what it, what it means to be a disciple. What is a disciple? So, somebody is looking to be shaped. So it's not just Great. imparting knowledge of, okay, now, I, now somebody has educated me as a prophet. It's, okay, I want to be a different person, and I'm 
investment to this other individual who's searching? Yeah, it's not just informational. A lot of the learning that uh, occurs in, in our world, I guess we can say, is you go in a classroom, you sit down, some person tells you some stuff, and then you record that stuff, commit it to memory, and then you pass a test, you learn from them. Well, that doesn't mean that you're their disciple. That just means you got some info from them. They transferred information. To be a disciple is something different. Uh, we might think of the difference of uh, just informational learning like that versus maybe uh, an apprentice, somebody who goes and actually walks beside. They learn how to hold the tool in the same way that the master holds it. They learn uh, the processes that the master goes through to prepare doing the thing. And yeah, they get some informational knowledge about the process, but they're being shaped and formed. Go ahead. I think you're right. I think we're going to come back to that notion of humility a couple of times in our discussions, I think, because really that is one of the most critical elements. It's somebody who, if we could put it in, in active terms, somebody who humbles himself. This is back to the sitting at the feet thing, where I say, I don't really know. I'm not shaped the way I need to be shaped yet. I'm not formed into what I need to be yet. I need you. I trust you. And so I want you to shape me and make me into what I need to be. Go ahead, please, please. I'm sorry. This is great. The word discipline, it's almost the word disciple when you really think about it in our, in our language, right? I mean, it's just almost, it's right there on, on the cover. And I think it's a great one. This is not something that you just accidentally stumble into. Somebody used the idea of being committed to somebody's teaching. If you're going to be a disciple, it's going to take discipline. It's going to take effort. It's going to be a, a on-purpose kind of thing. In other words, we're not going to be the kind of men that Jesus commands, and commands us to be and demands that we be on accident, just by happenstance, or frankly, just by showing up and sitting on a pew once in a while. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. There's an ongoing discipline that's required for us to do this. I want us to, to shift gears a little bit here, but so thanks for sharing all these. These are great. I, one, one way that I heard somebody describe it in kind of a, a, a simple, but I thought memorable kind of way, that a disciple is a learner who follows and a follower who learns. You get information, and then you go execute on that information. But you're not just going and doing it. You're being shaped, imitating the master. But then as you imitate the master, what do you find out as you go? I don't know all the information that I need to keep on following you. So actually, as I'm following you, I need to learn more. And there's this constant cycle of learning and following and following and learning uh, throughout this process. That's what Jesus wants to be. Look at Matthew chapter 4 if you're there in your Bibles and read with me starting in verse 18 where we see Jesus calling the first disciples. Matthew 4, and verse 18, I'd like you to notice what is said about these men. What are the details given about them uh, as Jesus calls them to follow him? Matthew 4, verse 18. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Uh, so here, emphasis on the following, right? He calls it, he says, follow me, follow me, and they did follow him indeed. So big emphasis on this notion of becoming disciples. There's a commitment here pretty clearly by the changes that occur even in this very text. But I want us to do something with this before we really get into what it, what it takes. What are the fundamentals of following Jesus and what Jesus calls people to? Uh, what do you notice in the text is said about these men? What details are given in the, in the text as these men um, are here at this bridge point in their lives as they cross over to begin following Jesus? What details do we have about them? Sorry? It's immediate. It's something that they go after. All right, good. They leave something behind. They leave something behind. All right, good. File that away, by the way. We're going to talk more about some of that in a minute. Uh, go ahead. Talk about it. They already have a discipline. What do you mean? 
Yeah. This, is, this was their occupation. It occupied them. They were constantly doing it. No doubt had learned many things. By the way, where did some of them learn? We, we were pretty confident we can say where at least a couple of these guys learned, uh, became what they were. That's a bad question. Somebody bail me out here. From their dad. Thank you so much for rescuing me there. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, so there, there's a shift in who they're learning from, who they're being discipled by, who they're being disciplined by. Go ahead. Sure, that's right. That's right. And he doesn't presume that he can. Now, we don't know what Zebedee's relationship may have been with Jesus eventually, but this does indicate Jesus is the one who calls. Jesus is the one who's the real master. There's that humility aspect, that respect that we talked about that goes with this. All right, good. So uh, keep going. What else do we know? I mean, just from this little snapshot, what else do we know about these men before they were disciples? We'll talk about it. All right. They had learned to submit. Now, who knows? It's interesting to think about what they were submitting to for them. We don't know, but they understood, I now need to submit myself to this one. This is my new master. He's going to be the one that I'll follow. Great, yeah. They were disciples. They made life-changing decisions right there on the spot. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. And it was life-changing. We've already highlighted a couple of these things. There's going to be a new relationship between James and John and their father. Uh, you know, it's interesting, James and John's mom comes up later. You remember the time whenever they uh, got their mom to go ask Jesus if they could have special seats in the kingdom and all that kind of stuff. I don't know what happened to their dad. No mention is made of him, and I'm not saying that they never saw their dad again or anything like that. But there was a different relationship now with their father than what they had before. As was already highlighted by a couple of they, their occupation, the thing that was going to occupy their time was being disciples of Jesus. And of course, he was going to be giving them different work to do than the work of being fishermen. He says that, doesn't he? Notice what Jesus actually says, the import and the significance of following him. What is it? What's going to really change in their life as they follow him? What they're fishing for. And I also say this, it may even go a little deeper than that, who they are. Right now, they're fishermen. He says, but I'm going to make you fishers of men, I'm going to make you, back to that shaping idea that I think you pointed out earlier, I'm going to turn you into something different. You were this thing over here, but I want you to come follow me, and I'm going to change you into that thing over there. Uh, their finances were going to be different after this. I don't know what that means exactly, but you know it was going to be different. Um, their standing in the community was going to change as a result of this. So many things shifted. Disciple, the life of discipleship is the life of embracing an entirely different identity. And I'd like, I thought about us doing a cutesy little let's talk to each other thing, but I think we're just going to be stoic men for two minutes. All right? Is everybody okay with that? And I'd like you, I'd like you to really think about this, okay? So, so uh, the bio for, for these guys, if they had a LinkedIn profile, it would say, uh, you know, Simon, Fisherman, Coworker Andrew, whatever else, right? Um, James and John, it would say their stuff. Talk about how they were co-owners with their father of their fishing business. And uh, John was responsible for making net mending or whatever, you know, all this kind of stuff. I want you to think for just a second. For some of you, this may be pretty tough, but I'd like you to, to really try to do this, okay? Imagine that you were not a follower of Jesus. Imagine that you are not a follower of Jesus. And, and, and once again, if you're actually here and you're not a follower of Jesus, then this is in your imagination, just write it down. Uh, and if you have a piece of paper, it'd be great. If you don't, you can pull out your app on your phone, or if you have a good memory, just think about it. What would be the description of your identity? And y'all know me, I was just being a little silly with uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John's LinkedIn profile. But what about if you were not a follower of Jesus? What would be your little short biographical blurb? Here's what I'm occupied by and what I occupy myself with. Here's how I relate to my world and society around me and uh, which relationships really matter. And here's some, what would be your little short bio blurb if you were not a follower of Jesus? I want you to take two minutes and really think about that. Jot down a couple things. Uh, like I said, pull out your notes app, pull out a piece of paper, and really just imagine for a second if you were not a follower of Jesus, just like these men were not followers of Jesus. <laughs> What would be 
your identity, who you are. All right, everybody good? I'm not going to ask you to share, but I'm just going to say what I imagine is probably true across the board with, some, with an exercise like this. Uh, because we know what people put in their little bios. Or if somebody asked you, you're going to do something at work and you're going to be introduced to a group of people, what should we say about you? Well, here's my job and I've been here this many times and this is my wife and my kids or... Uh, I'm from this place, or I graduated from here, and all this kind of stuff, right? So we have all these, uh, you know, on the back of your baseball card, this is what it says about you, okay? Uh, what is that stuff? And what it is, is stuff that Jesus says, come follow me, and I'm going to reformat all of that. Starting with our sense of our worth. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 5 now, just a page over, or maybe right there in the same, very same opening. Whenever Jesus called the disciples, he gave them a new sense of their worth. Uh, you can see in Matthew 5 and verse 1, it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, at this point, certainly there were more than just the four that were his disciples, but at least would have included these four. So just think about these men, and imagine that maybe we've joined them alongside. And here they come to Jesus. Before, what was Peter's worth? Well, his worth was in part measured by how much he brought home to provide for his family, or what his standing was in the community because of the work that he contributed. We know that James and John had a little issue about their worth in terms of their acceptance in certain situations, because remember what, when Jesus was rejected in that Samaritan town, how did James and John take that? Do you remember? Let's burn them down. We can't handle this, right? It's an attack on my worth as a man. We got rejected in this way. Whenever Jesus called the disciples... He said, come follow me. Your worth is not going to be measured by how many fish you bring in or by whether your dad's proud of you or by whatever people in the community think of you. Here's how you're going to measure your worth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in case you think that you, they, the theirs is somebody that doesn't include you, Jesus says, and blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What's Jesus doing in the Beatitudes? Many things, uh, many important and wonderful things, and we could just spend our whole lives, and we should actually, reflecting on and meditating on and, and embracing these uh, statements. But part of what Jesus is doing is reformatting for his disciples. Hey, how do you measure your worth? How do you measure your standing in the world? When you look in the mirror and you feel good about who you are and what you're being as a man, what's the, the measuring stick for you? Jesus says, this is the measuring stick for your worth. Are you someone who's poor in spirit? Someone who's meek? Someone who hunger and thirst for right? Who's a peacemaker? Who's persecuted for righteousness sake? That's actually the measure of true worth. And he goes on to, to uh, extend on this when he says, hey, whenever you live this way, you're the life preservation for the earth. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world whenever you do this. When Jesus called the disciples, 
He gave them a new sense of their worth. Let me show you another uh, thing that Jesus does. Turn over to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Imagine you're there with Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and you're kind of intrigued by Jesus. And you say, hey, so what's it like following Jesus? You know, what, what, what exactly does it entail? Uh, I'm amazed by his miracles and his teachings. Amazing. I've never heard anybody like this anymore. And then verse 18 happens. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Did you always find that interesting that Jesus was not real impressed with the crowds that wanted to follow him? I'm sure everybody else was impressed by the big crowds, but Jesus wasn't impressed. Jesus was looking for something different than crowds. He was looking for disciples. Then a scribe came and said to him, a Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And I imagine somebody in the crowd saying, Are you sure you want to go with him? He goes on and says, uh, Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and allow the dead to bury their dead. What's Jesus doing here? When Jesus called the disciples, he demanded that they reorder their priorities. We see that in Peter, Andrew, James, and John. You've got to drop your net if you're going to follow Jesus. You, he's not going to stay right there by the sea. He's moving on, and you've got to go. He's going inland. He's not going to stay right there where you can do whatever you want to do and say, I'm going to set the priority, Jesus, but you get to be in my life too. Congratulations. No, that's not what it means to be a disciple. That's not what it means to be a man of God. To be the kind of man that Jesus commands of us and demands of us means that we reorder our priorities in radical ways. So this scribe, Jesus says, hey, well, are you interested in comfort, security, or even knowing where you're going to sleep? I don't have a place to lay my head. You sure you want to follow me? Because that's what it's going to take. A reordering of your priorities. The kind of security that most men, especially, we want to have. I want to know where I'm going to sleep. I want to know, is it safe? And what's going to happen? You may not have that. If that's a priority for you, you have to check that at the door. And what about the man who says, well, I got, you know, and, 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 and uh, was this... I am going to wait around until my father passes away. Was this a statement about just going through the uh, rituals of, of burial? Jesus says, you know what? You got to leave that alone. Come follow me. You let that be taken care of by somebody else. You got to reorder your priorities. Uh, your little bio. Do you have some priorities there? Here's the things that are important to me. Here's the things that I value the most. Here's the things that make my life have meaning. Jesus says, you got to reset that whole deal. As a matter of fact, really, you don't even get to have your own priorities. I'm the one setting the priorities for you. I'm the one dictating this to all of you. I want to highlight two more, then I want to open it up and, and, uh, for everybody to just kind of contribute their thoughts on these. Uh, go over to Matthew chapter 9, actually, for one more of this, though, on the priorities thing. Um, you, you see, like, just the comfort and, uh, and their relationship to maybe family. But in Matthew chapter 9, you've got another priority. You know, it's an important thing to have respect among your peers or in your community. In Matthew chapter 9, the, Jesus was walking by a tax collector named Matthew. And he said to him, follow me. I always imagine that where they're walking, Jesus, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and here they go. And then, they, and then Jesus stops and looks at Matthew for a second. And the disciples think, finally, I've been waiting for this day. He's going to get him. And then Jesus says the same words to them, uh, excuse me, to Matthew, that he said to them back by the sea. Wait a second. Are we, I thought, he's not just a sinner, Jesus. He's in the special category of sinners. We put them in another thing, tax collectors and sinners. And he gets to follow? And then to make matters worse, you remember Jesus goes to Matthew's house for a dinner party with a bunch of the other dirty sinners and tax collectors. And when they're there, some of the Pharisees say, why does your teacher eat with the bad people? Why does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? And I love that the disciples don't answer. I don't know if that's because they didn't have an answer. I imagine that that may have been it. That the Pharisees said, what is going on? And John's like, I... and then Jesus steps in. And he says, what's going on is I'm reordering their priorities. Verse 12 it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, 
but sinners. When Jesus called the disciples, he demanded that they reorder their priorities. Go to chapter 10. Chapter 10, by this point, uh, Matthew records that it wasn't just uh, the five that we've talked about so far, so far, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew. Chapter 10 begins, it says, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And then he names off the, the 12 disciples. Uh, lots of interesting things to talk about as far as this collection of men. Maybe, Lord willing, tomorrow in one of our sessions we'll get to talk some more about this, uh, the way Jesus selected these men and the types he chose. But in ver- beginning in verse 5, um, and I'll just open it up. What is Jesus doing here? In verse 5, and if you just kind of peruse your way down to about verse 14 or 15, what's, what's Jesus doing in this text with these men who he has called to be his disciples? He's given them something to do, right? Yeah, I would just say so. Yeah, he's had to relax. And, and which part are you particularly thinking of with the trust? We're right back to reordering priorities. Uh, financial security is not a priority for you guys anymore. Y'all can't even take extra money, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, so he gave them something to do. And what are the types of things that they're supposed to do? There's the don't take money, but what, what does he say are the types of things they're supposed to do? Preach. Preach. The kingdom is at hand. Uh, what else? Cast out demons. Heal the sick. I like that one line. Freely you have received, freely give. I, I think we can summarize this section by saying that Jesus assigned them purposeful work to do. Now, in actuality, and I don't know if they were being purposeful about it in a godly manner, but fishing is purposeful if you're providing for your household and providing for those who are in need, right? But Jesus, in a special way, makes them pay attention. Hey, I'm giving you work to do. I have purpose behind this. Um, And it's something that's assigned. Uh, Verse 1, he summoned them. This is not an invitation. We use that word invitation. Like, I get invited to stuff, and I'm like, "Ah, I don't think I'm going to go, or maybe I will go. Who knows? That is not what this is. Hey, come over here. I got a job for you to do, and you need to get on it, right? Let me give you one more thing. Actually, let me me pause right here uh, before I get to the one more thing on on this list. What do you guys want to say about these things? Uh, Notice how these, I think, confront us. What is it that I measure my worth by? What are the metrics that I use to determine whether my life is worth something? Some of us, it's how high we climb in our careers. Some of us, it's how uh, healthy we look or how many friends we're able to win over or uh, how good our kids are. Or uh, I mean, you just keep on going with all these kind of metrics. And some of them are actually good things. They are, right? But they're lacking and they're ultimately empty if they're not deriving their worth from what Jesus says. What about our priorities? And and by the way, what you think your your worth is measured by, that sets your priorities. If you think the more money you have or financial security, that's what determines your worth or what makes your life worthwhile, what's your priority your whole life? I got to figure out how to make more money. I'm always checking the stocks. I'm always trying out whatever the new thing is to try to do this kind of deal. If you think just a career achievement is what you'll be able to look at the back at the end of your life, you'll say, hey, I was wor- my life was worth something because I achieved X, Y, Z in my career. Well, then what's your priority? It's going to be working as many hours as possible and taking every promotion and maybe mistreating some people along the way. Maybe not being very meek, for instance. Maybe not... Uh, thinking about how to show compassion and mercy to others very much, right? Because that's, that's how my worth is measured. That's my priority. And we could go in all those other directions, same kinds of things. Um, and, of course, what is your life going to be occupied with? Whatever it is that you think your life really means and what it's all about. Jesus says, come over here and follow me. What do you guys want to say about this? Open floor. Uh, thoughts, comments, observations. Go ahead, brother. Which, oh, thank you for saying that. These things are things that Jesus himself was doing, which is the nature of discipleship, right? What is a disciple? It's not somebody who comes in the classroom, gets a bunch of info, and then they go out in the field and do it, and the teacher may or may not have ever done it. No. This is a, the teacher saying, come follow me while we do this. Go ahead. Right. 
right. Yeah. And how about this, by the way? Cause I, lo- I love you sharing that because I think we can see that with somebody who just in, in, initially becomes a disciple. But here's what I want to challenge you with. Remember I told you a few minutes ago to jot down. Your, if you were not a follower of Jesus, what would your bio say? This is what my life's all about. All right. How different is that list of stuff in that imaginary world where you're not following Jesus? How different is that from your life following Jesus. You understand what I mean? Some of us who've sat on pews for a very long time, who can maybe quote a bunch of Bible verses, led singing and done lots of things in church, our imaginary self who is not a follower of Jesus is pretty much the same guy as the person who is supposedly following Jesus. You see that what could be the problem there? If I'm not that much different than my imaginary self who isn't following Jesus, have I submitted to Jesus as my teacher, as my master? Have I allowed him to set the measure of my worth? Have I made him set the, reorder the priorities in my life? Is he the one who's dictating what my work and my purpose is all about in life? Or am I ultimately just doing whatever I want to do or what the world tells me to do but I say I'm a Christian and I go to church. And by the way, it's good to say you're a Christian. It's good to go to church. I'm not against those. I'm very pro pro those things. But this is more than that, y'all. It's about becoming something different. Keep going. Sorry, I got preachy again. I apologize. What you're saying about becoming something different, uh, reordering priorities, I believe you used that term a while ago. In a previous congregation, uh, that congregation's in Mission Work, Honduras, right down on the west coast on the Pacific Ocean. We literally went into the homes of people living on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. Million dollar waterfront homes made out of grass. And these men that we encountered were some of the road hard, put up, wettest looking men I've ever met in my life. They worked out in the sun every day under those boats. They were rough. They are not the guys that I would have picked to browse Jesus. They are not the guys that I would have picked to go to the synagogue and and, and, and argue with the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. So when these guys reordered their priorities and changed their life, I mean, it was a, it was a, par- it was a change. And that was a paradigm shift for me. I've always viewed Peter differently. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and the rest of them differently as I, as I read about them in the Bible since I learned that about these men I met on the west coast of, of, of the Bay of Fonseca in, in Honduras. I appreciate you sharing that because this is important. Uh, all these principles that we're seeing about disciples, they, they end up interacting with every man and woman, but we're all men here, so we're just focusing on that. Uh, Formatting them in slightly different ways, although we all end up kind of the same as we're going to see in just a second. I think Matthew and Peter were exactly the same in all the elements of how they expressed following Jesus. Certainly not. Jesus didn't even call them uh, to be exactly the same. And all those are actually gifts. And it's something that we need to understand. So in other words, we're not trying to turn into cookie cutter things. And this is important. It's, I think, one of the benefits of us meeting different types of disciples to understand that everybody's got a little different gift, a little different skill, a little different experience that Jesus converts into discipleship and turns into something really beautiful. Keep going. Other thoughts here from, uh, from these things that Jesus did when he called these disciples. And you guys may want to add to the list based on the passages we've read so far. Right, right. Yeah, this, I think this relates uh, to what was just shared. Their purpose uh, was singular, right? They had the same job to do. This purposeful work was the same. Um, but as they went about doing that, um, and think about it, in all the rest of the disciples, all the apostles basically had the same job. But that's not true of all the disciples. What are some jobs in the New Testament that we know disciples held? I mean things that they used to, to make, their, make their bread. 
Tent makers. Keep going. Carpenter. Other jobs. A fisherman, right? Good. And I'm thinking about jobs that people maintained after they uh, became followers of Jesus, by the way. Right? So I don't think he kept on the zealoting, right? Uh, and, and like, like uh, and maybe he did. I don't know. He may have. They got converted to something different. So let me give you some examples of uh, what I'm thinking about. Luke was a physician, and uh, he's called that quite a while after he was a follower of Jesus, so presumably he continued in that role. Um, there's multiple mentions of Christians or allusions to Christians who worked in different um, civic jobs, I guess we could say. I want to say government, but I don't mean they, they were civic, civil servants. Um, Lydia was a, a purple cloth seller, whatever that is. You know. Okay, so all these people had different jobs. But once they're disciples of Jesus, that job is converted into something different. Before it was about how can I be the most successful? How can I make the most money? How can I beat the other people at whatever? No, now it's something bigger, it's something more significant, something better that we're doing because we're disciples. It converts whatever we are and whatever we're doing into something else. All right, good. Other thoughts, please. It should be so much so that if a group of us were in a place, people would say, those people, they, all those disciples, they, they're like little Christ. They're, I don't know, Christians. Let's call them that. That's how much it should be. My brother hit it on the head. Are you there in chapter 10 still? Look at verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough. It is enough. For the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. When Jesus called the disciples, he gave them a model to pursue. Peter remembered this. Uh, A couple of scriptures were already referenced here. Do you remember what Peter said about this in 1 Peter 2 and verse 21? He's in the middle of talking about how hard it is to be a Christ follower in the world, a disciple whenever the world is at odds against Jesus and his purposes and wants to tell you that your worth is measured by whether or not you're accepted or whether or not you're powerful and your priority needs to be getting yours and ignoring it, all this kind of stuff, right? And Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, for you were called, I wonder if he thought about himself there, when Jesus called him, same language in Matthew 4, for you were called for this very purpose, that you may follow in his steps. That you may follow in his steps. Trying to fit your toes where his little toe prints were. Trying to put your heel down just like him. Learning, and you know what, at first as you put your feet in, have you ever done that before by the way? 
maybe you're a little kid getting in some footprints and it's kind of awkward. Your legs don't actually bend the same way that that person's legs are as you fit yourself into their footstep. But the more you do it, the more you learn to walk the way they walk. So much so that in Peter's letter that he wrote near the end of his life, remember what he said? He said, hey, uh, we who were first called, we apostles, we have these precious and great promises. And what were those precious and great promises for? They were to give to people so that people would share the same faith that those first ones who were called had. And what was it all about? That you may become partakers of the divine nature. That you become something different. I don't know. Maybe you look at that little exercise we did where you write out the... And maybe, by the way, you're like, well, I can't even imagine not being a Christian. And good on you, brother. You're probably right where you need to be if you couldn't even do the exercise. That's good. But if you're a little bit discouraged where you say, you know what? I'm not sure if I'm even much of a disciple at all. I may be a pretty good guy who goes to church. And I need to figure out how to actually follow Jesus. Actually make him measure my worth. Actually reorder my priorities. Change in all the ways that Jesus... Do the work that he wants me to do at my job and in my family and in my community. i got to make some changes here. Good. Let's do it. That's what this whole thing's about, y'all. By the way, that's why all those letters were written. That's why to the Colossians, he said, hey, you got to put off all this stuff and put on this stuff. Why? So that you may be renewed in the image of your creator. We're not done yet. This is the whole program, y'all. Jesus called the disciples, giving them a model to pursue. When he said, come follow me, he was saying, come become like me. And that's enough. That's what this whole thing is about. The whole thing. And as we talk, here in just a minute, whenever we take a break and come for our second session, as we talk tomorrow, and really in everything we do, in our worship, in our Bible study, in our prayers, in the service we render, in the jobs that we work, in our roles in our families, whenever we're combating sin, when we're helping others combat sin, the whole point is that we would become like Jesus. To embrace the identity of a disciple of Jesus is to embrace a life mission, life mission of becoming like Christ himself. This is what it's all about. It's not about scoring brownie points with God. It's not about feeling better about ourselves. It's not accomplishing a bunch of things or passing things to the next generation. All that stuff is going to happen. That's good, except the brownie points with God. That's by the grace of God we have all that. But you understand what I'm saying. All that other stuff are incidentals to the mission. And the mission that Jesus came and lived and preached and worked and died for and rose again for and reigns now in heaven for is that we would become like him that we would share his very nature, that we would recapture the, what God made us to be in the very beginning, his image bearers on the earth. Jesus came to put us back together again. Though we busted ourselves apart by our selfishness and by our sin and by our obsession with this world and our own things, Christ has given us a new life mission that we would become like him. And for us, we know that if we reject this mission, it's not like rejecting other offers other calls, other summons. Because if you try to be the best you, if you try to be like your great mentor or like your father in the flesh, you've lost it all. Because there's only one in whom was life, and the life was the light of men. Only one. And it was the one who walked on the sands of that sea and said, come Follow me. If we reject the life mission of embracing the identity of being followers of Jesus to become like Jesus himself, then I don't really care what you wrote down on your bio. It's all garbage anyways. This is what it's all about. The way Jesus put it is this. Follow me. And that is enough. We're going to pause right here, and uh, let's, uh, let's just plan on uh, giving ourselves maybe a five-minute break. And we're going to kind of continue our thoughts to think about one really key critical thing that, uh, that requires, uh, that's required for us to be able to live this life of discipleship. So let's keep it going. Thank you so much for the good conversation. We'll take a five-minute break and then uh, sit back down. Thanks.